uh, it's such a pleasure for me to join uh, in fellowship and worship the Lord together. And I thank God for this privilege. And today I could get to uh, share from God's word. Let me share my screen first. Okay, you could see the title of my message today on the screen, that is language. It's a very important uh, aspect in our life, lives. What is language? Language is the tool by which people are tuned to each other. This is a tool we use to communicate with one another. And you imagine if we don't have any language, how we would be communicating with each other. Can, uh, can our people understand what we have in our heart and mind? Can we communicate what the, the thoughts that we have in our minds if we don't have language? It seems it's impossible to communicate without a language. And the language is a system of portraying information via symbols called words, and combining them in uh, structures, or you can call it sentences, with grammatical rules. It is a system we have created amongst ourselves. And we have introduced some symbols, which we call words. When we, every word will be have, we, is a symbol that we use. Every word we use is a symbol to a reality. And this language works by attaching symbols to a reality. When we say the word elephant, we would be having a picture of elephant. And this word would be related to that reality. The other day, I and Pearl were uh, thinking and were discussing about uh, how we should teach our kid. And we were reading certain pages in the, uh, inter uh, in the website. We were, uh, we were searching how we should teach to our children. And they have given us some interesting points. And one among them, I would like to share it with you. That is, we should not teach children with symbols, but we should teach the children with the real pictures. For example, if you want to teach a children what an elephant is, you show the children, child the real picture of an elephant rather than using the cartoon picture of an elephant. If we teach them with the cartoon picture of an elephant, it will entertain them, but they would not be able to get, get connected to the reality. So when we teach children, they, are, they were encouraging us that we should be teaching children with the real images. So from this, we understand one thing that is, when we communicate or this language, when we are learning something with the symbols, we may not be able to completely connected. We may not be able to totally related to the very reality of those symbols. So as I said, and every language and every word that we use is more like a symbol to a reality. Cat symbol, the word cat is uh, a symbol for the real cat and that's how we communicate and humans we learn language through social interaction from early childhood and from explicit learning at school we all learn our mother tongue because we are hearing the mother tongue at home our parents our brothers and sisters and the conversations that we are hearing around us through which we caught the language okay and children uh, from at the age of Three, they are heard like uh, they can learn every day 13 new vocabulary. I'm trying to learn two vocabulary a day, which is becoming really difficult to practice. But children at the age of three, from that time, they can learn at least 13 vocabulary a day. And that's how we all picked up the language. That's how we all become masters in our mother tongue. And this language, 
the language code which is which we call word is immaterial as i said the symbols these are immaterial they are not the reality but they are the symbols they are not material they are not a substance so this language code is immaterial and language works through its effect on the tuned audience so when i'm trying to communicate i'm using the symbols which are the words and if you are also having the same symbols in your mind we would be attuned and we would be able to have a bridge uh, to bridge of communication and each linguistic exchange generates a thought in the listener which most likely will not be identical with the thought of the speaker every time i speak a word use a word and speak to you even as i am speaking now i am trying to communicate i am trying to release an a thought into uh, sharing a thought with you the moment you hear the words you will uh, i mean your mind generates some thoughts in your own mind and this is the most unfortunate thing in our world that what i speak may not be identical with what you receive there is always been some kind of uh the uh, difference in uh, exchange in this exchange so that is why most of the times we will be having arguments and if you hear uh you, you know the arguments are all mostly they would be based on the words that we have used so the word every word we use will be having a connotation the words when i am using i will be having a connotation for every word and as you are receiving you also may be having a connotation for every word and sometimes so most of the times these two connotations are not identical i am not saying they are not similar they are similar we are able to communicate to uh, quite a good extent but these connotations may not be totally and 100% uh, identical if they were identical we would not be having any misunderstandings and this language works best when a speaker is able to find the tunes the audience can recognize including for communication with other species oh this is one of the big struggles i am also fa uh, facing i always ask pastor dan to help me out as i prepare my messages and speak to the church i i, I ask them I, ask, i always ask him to help me out understand what our congregation is what our congregation understand or what, what is the tune of our congregation so that i may be able to get into that tune so that we may have a proper communication and learning takes place uh, in both ways so this language works when pp when the speaker is able to get, get into the tune of the audience and uh, then it uh, it is the same even when if you are trying to communicate with other species when you are communicating with other species we should be able to get connected to what the species and that we should get tuned to them then only we will be able to communicate with them have you ever thought what it might be like to think without a language and sometimes struggling to put thoughts into words imagine just so just take a minute for yourself think about something without using any words can you do that can we think about something or can you imagine about something without using the words definitely it looks impossible isn't it we would not be able to think anything without language and what exactly is the thing the thought perception idea or feeling that precedes its own linguistic expression we, uh, when we are when we speak we speak with words have you ever thought about the thought uh, how the thought would be before that before we use the linguistic expressions either to ourselves or with others how is that mostly we would not be able to even recognize the thought unless we put words to that thought i don't mean that we cannot think we cannot have any thought without language because we all were in a place where we did not have language but we we, we never been in a place where we didn't have thoughts even the moment the moment the child borns you know they will be thinking they will be observing things they don't know the language they have thoughts 
they will be having you their own imaginations and uh, i just came across uh, a child uh, who was deaf from birth and the parents realized after some time and then they have taken the child for the treatment and uh, he was give, he was inserted uh, with some artificial uh, hearing machines uh, you know some devices through which he can learn and the parent was saying what well, we taught the child so many things and now since he already since he got this new device inserted he should learn everything all over again before we have the language before the child got a uh, language i mean the audible language the words he learned something so once the word comes he has to learn all together those things again because uh, uh, they they were in a place where the connotations may be different the connotations may be different the expressions are different there are there is a place for in all our lives where we uh, we could think we could uh, perceive certain things but we don't have any linguistic expressions but now as we learn the linguistic expressions as we learn the language we are not able to communicate or even think anything without linguistic expressions or without any uh, words or without any language and this would be the same experience so some of us may, might have first time when we when you fall in love you want to express your, uh, the other person that you love and you might have run short of short of words how to express that i love that you love the person so we all must be sometimes in a place where we may not have enough words we may not have words to express our thoughts so what i was trying to tell from this is we have thoughts we have feelings which are independent of linguistic expressions but now we are in a place we are not able to think about anything we are not in a place to we are, so we are in a place where we cannot think about anything we are not in a place where we can um, uh, communicate anything without any linguistic expressions what we think and our language are totally intertwined and intermixed that's why our consciousness and the narrative we tell ourselves the perspective that we have is completely intertwined with language so whatever the whatever the connotations we have for the various words they are going to influence our perspective and the language we have learned is going to uh, in the, what we'll call it, uh, influence our consciousness and it is going to influence the narrative what i meant by that is what we tell about ourselves to uh, i mean what we tell about us to ourselves and what we tell about world to ourselves what we tell uh, about others to ourselves this narrative this uh, consciousness this perspective has been totally influenced by the language now and this language includes the written form including the scriptures the reason i mentioned this is we, this is the connection to the next slide this language is not just verbal expressions but even written scripture comes to the same category but this language has some uh, some limitations of course i am not going to explain all the limitations of this language but i am going to present before you few limitations that the language has language can represent a reality but can, but it cannot describe it describe it completely it can represent a reality so as i said every word is a symbol to a reality and it can describe something about that reality it can represent that reality but it cannot explain anything sorry everything about the reality and the greatest perversion of the language is when it claims that it captured the beauty what i mean by that is you you know the poets are the people who are able to use the language very well i always used to think you know if i have good language like the other person i would be able to communicate better <clears throat> if i am able to compose sentences like a, a poet i would be able to explain things better and i could show uh, i could sh uh, show things to the people as it they really were in telugu we have an expression called kalla kattinattu chupinchadu you know through words when we hear some words they are they will be drawing some pictures they will be portraying some pictures in our minds 
అండ్ కళ్ళ కట్టినట్టు కనిపించడం మీన్స్ when we explain in such a way the people could really feel the great details of a reality okay but if a poet thinks that with his words he can completely describe beauty if he complete if he feels through words he can completely explain about a reality then that is the greatest perversion of the language few years ago i visited a Uh, himalayan mountains i could i got god in his mercy gave me the opportunity to uh, put up three nights on himalayan mountains you know especially uh, you should visit himalayan mountains during the full moon if you visit uh, himalayan mountains during full moon it is an entirely a different world you will experience there the moon will be as bright as it can and uh, he shines so brightly and the light Uh, uh, falls on the uh, white snow and the snow reflects it okay the moon is already bright and the snow is also reflecting that uh, moon's moonlight so the entire place turns so bright and you can take literally you can take a newspaper and read midnight 12 o'clock also that beautiful is the himalayan mountains during full moon night and if uh, this is the description of uh, uh, himalayan mountains during full moon uh, night and if i told you so that's how himalayan mountains would be and you don't need to go and see that is the perversion of the language that is a perversion of expression or any uh, uh, yeah perversion of any expression and we have we, we found some uh, some good examples in the bible one example we can find in uh, find is in john chapter 5 verse 39 and 40 and the uh, converse, the context is uh, uh, sorry in this context jesus was speaking to the pharisees and he told them you search the scripture because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness about me yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life as i said the scripture the written forms are also a language they are form of a part of it these are some expression the scripture is explaining about god and these people on the other side these are reading the scripture they are studying the scripture thinking that they can find eternal life in them but actually these scriptures are talking about somebody that is jesus but these people fail the scripture by thinking that scripture has everything they want and everything they need uh, in the christian world it is very common for us to say oh we are the people of the bible we are the people of the scripture we are not people of the scripture or bible we are the people of god and the scripture is talking about god and sometimes we obsess uh, we, we we get obsessed so much into the scripture we would not be able to connect to the reality that scripture is pointing just like this pharisee the scripture is pointing to in uh, uh, eternal pointing to the eternal life new life that is in jesus christ and these people are still caught up in the scripture there itself believing and this expression has everything that need that they need you know as christians even we if we think that we can find everything that we want in the scripture that we would be the most pitiable people in the world and because scripture is a truthful witness to jesus christ the scripture leads us to jesus christ and with the witness of the scripture if we if we could encounter jesus if we could reach jesus with the witness of the scripture if we could uh, relate to the language of god through jesus christ that is the fulfillment of the scripture and i'll uh, and if we think the scripture is everything that we we need to have just like this pharisees we might have failed the scripture because they could not in their lives the purpose of scripture could not be fulfilled and we have another example in the bible uh, that explains the purpose of the language the purpose of the language is to inspire the listener to go and feel the reality that being described as i told previously if i gave the description of himalayan mountains if i told you and this is the description of himalayan mountains this is what himalayan mountains are all about and you don't need to go and see then that is the perversion but by with my expression with whatever i have explained with my descri- the description i have given you about himalayan mountain you got a desire in your heart 
oh, it's so beautiful. Let me go and check it. Let me see the beauty of those mountains. Then the purpose of my description has been fulfilled. In the same way, the purpose of language is to inspire the listener to go and feel the reality that's being described. We find an example in Bible that is in First Kings chapter 10, verse 6 and 7. Uh, Solomon was so wise. And uh, in verse 1, we find there were people who went to Queen Sheba and spoke about Solomon and his wisdom and the way the glory of Solomon's kingdom. And hearing that, Sheba was inspired to come and visit Solomon and check for herself. And she came and she stayed some days with Solomon. And then she said in verse 6 and 7, she said to the king, the report I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true. But I did not believe these things until I come. I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half was told me, which means I have seen even more great. In wisdom and wealth, you have far exceed the report I heard. Can you see the true, uh, uh, the true expression of this language? The, uh, she, the whatever she heard that inspired her to come and see the Solomon's glory and she realized what Solomon has much more than what has been explained to me by the people and it could not even kind of explain half of it this is an example we can see where the purpose of the language the purpose of an expression has been fulfilled so Number one, the limitation is, limitations is a language could not, could not describe the reality completely. And uh, the perversion of the language is when it claims that it captured the beauty or when it, it could describe the beauty. And the reason I use the word beauty is God is more like a beauty to admire. And uh, he, is, he is like a truth that has to be adopted. He is not a, a subject or an object uh, sorry, he is not an object which has to be examined uh, or which has to, which has uh, some uh, what will say which can be explained. God is not an uh, object to be explained, but he is like a beauty to be admired and adored and worshipped. And there are no perfect languages in the world, but there is one perfect language which completely connects us to the reality. As I said, the language is a representation of reality in symbols. <coughs> there is only one perfect language that can directly connects us <coughs> to the reality. And that language could be found in John chapter 1, verse 1. When John wrote, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The Greek word used in the place of word is logos, which means of speech, a word uttered by a living voice or embodies a concept, uh, a, embodies a conception or idea. Actually, the better, one of the better ways to translate these words, uh, this word logos is language. There is, there has been a conversation in Godhead in the beginning. In the beginning, there was a conversation. In the beginning, there was an exchange of words. In the beginning, there was an exchange of con concepts. In the beginning, there was an exchange of idea. In the beginning, there was a language. That, that exchange, that John wanted to communicate to us uh, when he wrote this word, in the beginning was the word. It is, it is not like a, he doesn't want to communicate. There is some kind of audible voice uh, in the eternity past. That's not his intention he wanted to communicate to us there was a conversation going on there was a uh, there was a place where exchange of ideas exchange of concepts exchange of thoughts was happening and this can happen only through a language so there is one perfect language in the world and that language is the logos the word that we can find in john chapter 1 verse 1 and this long logos, as I said, one of the better ways to translate is language. This language is never and never an impersonal voice or message or conversation. This is not just 
just exchange of words only. This is a person. And it is relational, but, uh, but not, uh, uh, it's, it is relational. It's not an energy according to quantum physics. Uh, kindly forgive me for that uh, typing error. So this logos, this language, this conversation, it is not impersonal. This is the person that is Jesus Christ. And this is relational. It is not just happening in the Trinity, uh, like in you know, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they sat uh, near a, you know, what we'll call uh, a, a, a fire, and they were telling, Father telling Son, okay, Son, I love you. And Son says, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. I love you. Oh, no, this is not about that only. This is the expression has been taken place completely through the through a person that is Jesus Christ. Okay, this is not some kind of uh, energy uh, as in quantum physics. Some people say uh, in the beginning was the word which means the sound of God was there. And through that sound, everything has been created. Uh, and they speak about the vibrations of the sounds. They speak about dynamic power of the sound. And they say the same sound has been put into your mouth through the scripture. When you claim the promises of God based on the scripture, you are releasing the same energy into the world, which uh, the same energy, the same sound, the same word which created the worlds are going to create whatever you require into this world. Have you heard about such? There are lots of people who speak about that. This is not that kind of sound. This is totally a, a personal conversation where an exchange of love was taking place. And the language works best when a speaker can find the tunes the audience can recognize. It's the same communication with other species. Uh, this is the word I spoke in the previous slide. And this explains the, one of the main reasons behind the incarnation. You know, this God can communicate well when he is able to get into our tunes. That's the very reason this God came in human flesh, like you and me, so that he can communicate the same conversation that was happening in between Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He may bring the same conversation into our midst. That's the reason he has taken, he, he was also taken uh, the flesh. And it is just like the parable, uh, just like in the parable of the vineyard owner, the vineyard owner has sent his servants to the people. Uh, but the, those, I mean, uh, those people have killed their servants and the master thought, now I will send my son. They may listen to him. They may understand him. The same way, the same way. Uh, God, he came as human, believing that through that, he may be able to communicate to us. He may get into get in tune with us so that he can communicate the word, the message, the conversation the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit were having from eternity past may involve us into that conversation and reveal the same conversation to us. And the same logos of the language have taken human flesh and connected us to the very reality of God's heart, will, love, or which is, which is talking about our redeemed sonship in Jesus Christ through incarnation. This language is not immaterial, but substantial substance. I know through this was substantial substance. I have given extra uh, details. Uh, I have a reason for that. I will explain you. And this language, as I said, it, it has taken human flesh. It, it, is connect, it connected us to the reality. As I told previously, every word has, uh, every word is a symbol and it represents a reality. The word represents a reality. When we speak, when you speak the word elephant, we can, uh, we can think about elephant, but we will not be get in touch with elephant. We can think about elephant, we can get the picture of elephant, but we cannot experience elephant. But here in this language, what happens is, in this law, this language, when we come to Jesus, when we come to who is the language of God, we not only uh, get a representation of God the Father, we not only get some thoughts about God the Father, but we get in touch with God the Father. 
when Jesus, as a language he came, he did not just represent God the Father to us. He came and he embodied God the Father to us. He communicated through his embodiment. That's why when Philip, uh, he, uh, when Philip asked, show us the Father, Jesus said, haven't you seen me this long and how could you ask me to show us the Father? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So this language is not a symbol like the words that we are using, which represents a reality. But this language brings the reality to us. That is the incarnation, entire purpose of incarnation, to bring God to our presence where we can experience him in a tangible manner. That's what this language does. And this language is not immaterial. It is personal and it is, it is a substance. I wanted to communicate. That's the very reason I use the word substance. And it is substantial. It doesn't change. Yesterday, today and forever, Jesus is the same. Jesus is the face of God and the heart of God and the purpose and will of God forever. And which never changes. So through this language, we could get in touch or we could experience the reality of God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and the conversation that which they had from the foundation of the world in a tangible manner. And through incarnation, Jesus is turning uh, humanity to God's language and represented God's language in human tunes. He is connecting us to the language of God, what was happening in God. And here, he is not just getting connected to our tunes, but he is tuning us to God's love and God's message and his will. That's what Jesus has done in his incarnation. Our redeemed sonship is the conversation in God from the beginning. What was happening in the Father, between Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? Uh, if you remember my previous message also, I was talking about incarnation, the immensity of uh, uh, incarnation I was talking about uh, and explained. God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, what they, were, the, they, had, they were having a discussion and conversation and the conversation is completely about a redeemed sonship of humanity. You and me, God wanted to send his son into the world through him. He wanted to redeem all of us and he wanted to, wanted to make us his sons. That's what Apostle Paul writes in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 onwards. Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be his children. That is the conversation God, boy, God was having before the foundation of the world. It is always about the redeemed sonship of you and me. And Jesus, he brought us into that reality and into that conversation through incarnation. The same Jesus revealed when he taught us to pray. How does the Lord's prayer taught, uh, start us? It starts with our Father who art in heaven. It is ref reflecting about our redeemed sonship. Jesus made us the children of God. And he is teaching us to call God as Father. So he is connecting us to the reality of our redeemed sonship, which is the conversation, heart and will and thought of God, even before the foundation of the world. And that is the language of God. And Hebrews chapter, the same thing has been explained in uh, Hebrews chapter 1, 1 verse 1 and 2. I'm reading from mirror translation. This translation is not yet on, in the market. Uh, Mr. Francis du Toy. Uh, this man is translating the Greek Bible into English from a Trinitarian perspective. Uh, he, he just, uh, he's, he shared his book with me. It has uh, some selected passages and one among them is uh, this passage. He did not complete the Bible yet, but soon uh, they are going to release uh, a, Trinitarian, a translation which is translated in Trinitarian perspective from Greek. And he translates Hebrew chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 like this. Throughout ancient times, God's, uh, this is a, a paraphrase version, okay? Uh, Throughout ancient times, God spoke in many fragments and glimpses of prophetic 
thought to our fathers. Now, the sum total of his conversation with man has finally culminated in a son. He is the official heir of all things. He is, after all, the author of ages. Jesus is what had been on the tip of the father's tongue all along. What was God talking to our fathers from the beginning? He's talking about a redeemed reality in Jesus Christ. It is about incarnation. That's what in the tip of the father's tongue. In fact, better way to say that was a conversation happening in between father and the son from eternity. And the same thing has been revealed to our fathers from the beginning in glimpses. Uh, he has given us the glimpses in fragments. And now in completion, when Jesus came, he revealed it to us. And this is what he adds. The revelation of man's redeemed sonship as revealed in Jesus is the crescendo of God's conversation with humanity. Throughout the ages, he has whispered his name in disguise to be revealed in the fullness of time as the greatest surprise. God was talking about our redeemed sonship and in, he revealed that in glimpses. Now he revealed completely to his son. Jesus Christ. Jesus is the language of God. Jesus is the language through which God is expressing his heart, his will, his love for humanity. And Jesus is the very language where we could get in touch with the reality in a tangible manner, the reality of God's love and heart and God, God himself. And Jesus as the language of God is not just representing some reality, but he is bringing us to direct contact with that reality, the reality about God the Father in a tangible manner. That's what it means when we say, when we read the words, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen the glory of the glory of the only begotten of the Father. That's what it is talking about. It is talking about uh, God's heart and our redeemed sonship, which is the eternal purpose of God. In Jesus, we come in face to face with God. Through this language only, we'll be able to connect to God, not symbols. As uh, the psychologist said, uh, the difference we have seen uh, between the cartoon images and the real images. As he said, uh, we should teach our children with the real images, not through the cartoon images, which are symbols. And just like that, Jesus is bringing God in face to face with us directly. He's connecting us to God, to, the, to his reality. So in conclusion, Jesus is the perfect language of God in Trinity and with humanity. Jesus, as the perfect language of God, not only represents, reflects, and reveals the Father, but brings the very presence of the Father to us. This language doesn't work with symbols, but brings the reality to our tangible experience. And are we able to tune into the, that language? That's the challenge, challenge we have. Are we able to connect to God through Jesus? Or we are just simply pondering into only the scripture, thinking that we find life in them when the scripture is pointing us to the very life himself, that is Jesus. And I have a great value for scriptures. So if it could lead us to Christ, then its purpose is fulfilled. If it's not leading us to Christ, we fail the scripture. And once we come to Jesus, he will lead us into the greater depths of God's heart. And if we can tune into the logos, which is the language of God, if you can tune into logos of God, Jesus as the logos, which is another translation, another translation of the word is wisdom. Jesus as the wisdom of God opens infinite possibilities to experience God's heart. First, we need to get in tune with the language of God. Then God, Jesus opens us to the infinite possibilities to explore the wisdom of God. So 
I, I don't have any applications to give, but my, as I said, the purpose of the language is to inspire somebody to go and see the reality. So I've taken my purpose as, uh, the purpose of my message as to inspire you so that you may get in tune with Jesus. Try, your, try to get in tune with Jesus and explore the uh, God of infinite possibilities and his heart in infinite ways. That is the purpose of my message. Thank you so very much. And um, this is my prayer that God may grant us his wisdom and his grace so that we may get in tune with the language of God, which is Jesus, so that we may be able to explore the depths of God's wisdom and his heart and love. May God bless you.